Okay, welcome everybody to the third lecture in the series on blood vessels. Upload date is, of this is going to be November 18th, 2020. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to finish off looking at control of blood pressure and then look at the idea of tissue perfusion, which is all about how blood gets to the tissues that need it most. Okay. Uh, and so we're going to focus on long-term regulation of blood pressure. So that's finishing off from the short-term regulation we talked about last time. Uh, we're going to talk about a concept called autoregulation with regards to local blood flow. And then we're going to talk about a concept of capillary exchange. And again, this is something that's related to blood pressure as well. Uh, the relevant chapters in the text are, are chapter 19, and I, I've pinpointed some of the key pages there as well. Uh, and I've also identified some of the web resources that might be useful for you. Uh, so last time we left off, we were looking at short-term regulation by neuronal controls and by hormonal controls. And so we'll just touch on that a little bit, just so everybody remembers where we were. And so uh, short-term regulation by neuronal controls. One great example of this is the baroreceptors. So baroreceptors are in your carotid artery. And so these are these arteries in your neck. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to sense pressure. During high blood pressure, what happens is they signal to the vasomotor center the vasomotor center uh, is usually telling your blood vessels to constrict. So it's usually sending a positive message to your blood vessels telling them to, to constrict. When these receptors are active, that action is inhibited. So you're inhibiting a positive. And so what that's going to do is that's going to drive things back towards vasodilation. This is a review from last time. Uh, also a review from last time, what is a hormone? Uh, it's a, a substance, a thing that's produced in an organism in tissue fluids. And again, that could be blood or sap. Plants have hormones as well that stimulate specific tissues or cells into action. So these can be anything. They could be lipids, uh, amino acids, or, or, or a string of amino acids that are, we of course know as, as peptides or, or larger ones or, or proteins. Uh, these guys, uh, when they're regulating blood pressure, usually that's via uh, changing peripheral resistance. And so what that means is that they're changing uh, peripheral resistance in the short term by regulating the diameter of blood vessels at specific tissues. Okay. So again, if you, you regulate the blood diameter, the diameter of a blood vessel, then that's going to change the blood, uh, the blood pressure in your system. Um, and so we talked about a lot of different hormones. Um, we talked at the idea of epinephrine and norepinephrine at length. And I showed a diagram that I also showed in, in the section on the heart, okay? So similar types of signaling pathways. There's other hormones here. Again, we went over this last time, um, ADH, ANP, and angiotensin II. Again, some of these have short-term effects in higher quantities. Usually they're associated with longer-term effects. So uh, many of those effects are listed in this table here, 19.2. Um, and again, short-term effects are going to be other on be on the arterioles, so controlling uh, uh, diameter of those arterioles and blood vessels. The longer term effects are going to be on, on or sorry, short term effects can also be on the heart uh, through regulation of stroke volume and uh, heart rate. Uh, longer term effects, uh, these things don't do it. And what we need is a change in blood volume. How do you change blood volume? You change the amount of water in your system. Okay, that falls on the kidney because the kidney is responsible for, for urine output. And most of urine, of course, is also going to be water. Um, so why do we need this? Well, the, these kind of these baroreceptors, for example, that I showed at the beginning of the lecture, the, these are going to tire over time. They're, they're, they're not going to be able to, to sustain their regulation over time. They will adapt to chronic high or low blood pressure. And so, so really they're going to be ineffective over long-term regulation. And that's what I've written here on the top. And so again, longer term mechanisms are all about controlling the volume of your blood. Uh, volume of blood is dealt with by the kidneys, as I mentioned. Um, and really there's two different things to think about. There's direct regulation and indirect regulation. And so we'll first talk about the direct regulation. Direct regulation is pretty simple. The idea is that kidneys, we're not going to talk about the kidney in detail. This is something you'll hit in other a &P courses, but these are basically for filtering blood. The higher the pressure in the kidney, the more blood is filtered and the more uh, urine is, is output. So as the pressure rises in your blood vessels, you're going to get more filtration, more urine production, and more loss of water. So with increased blood pressure and blood volume, we're going to get 
increased elimination of urine, and ultimately that's going to cause a reduction in blood volume, and you're going to you're going to reduce the blood pressure. Okay, and then the decrease of blood pressure is actually going to have the opposite effect. So direct regulation, very simple, just a mechanical process about the amount of filtration that's happening in these kidneys. Okay, and that's all related to urine and therefore related to water output. Indirect regulation. Indirect regulation is based on a signaling cascade, and this is conceptually similar to the signaling cascade uh, that we see in the, the epinephrine, norepinephrine, cyclic AMP, these types of things. And so the idea here is that when you have decreased blood pressure, this is going to act on the kidneys, and, and in particular, uh, the adrenal gland of the kidney. And those adrenal glands are going to secrete a substance called renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 in your blood will be converted again to something else called angiotensin 2. And this is done by an enzyme called ACE, or conveniently enough, angiotensin converting enzyme. So let's go over that again. Decreased blood pressure is going to cause production of renin. Renin is going to convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. That's going to be converted by ACE to angiotensin 2. And this is the worker. Okay, so angiotensin II is a worker protein. It's an enzyme that's going to have various effects around the uh, around the body. Uh, four of those effects are listed here. So first of all, it's going to stimulate aldosterone secretion. If you look back at, at table 19.2, you'll see that this is involved in retention of both salt and water. Water will almost always follow salt. Okay, uh, we also will cause ADH release from the pituitary gland. So again, you can look up the function of this in 19.2. It'll trigger a hypothalamic thirst, so you're going to drink more water. More water is going to cause increased blood volume, is going to cause increased blood pressure. And that's what we want, okay, because the renin is secreted um, by the kidneys when blood pressure is low. Uh, they will also act as a potent vasoconstrictor, and again, this is going to directly increase blood pressure. This is also used as a short-term regulation mechanism. Okay, So this is the interplay between um, angiotensin and also other uh, uh, hormones such as aldosterone and ADH. Uh, so um, since the last lecture then, we've gone over short-term controls in terms of um, short-term Neural controls, short-term hormonal controls, and also long-term uh, control of, of uh, regulation of blood pressure uh, through the kidneys. And as you'll see in this diagram here um, that's in the book, that, that this, again, is connected to, to everything else that, that you've heard me talk about so far, okay, including some of the uh, material that we covered in the heart, such as the stroke volume and heart rate. So heart rate goes up, a stroke volume goes up, you're going to have cardiac output, which is going to increase and mean arterial pressure will increase. This is the type of thing that can be sensed by those baroreceptors that, again, can be uh, regulating short-term blood pressure control, okay? And so when we say that, that sometimes in exams we like to test your ability to integrate concepts together, this table is really kind of an excellent example of, of, of that. Um, and so as we approach the final exam, I'll come up with some questions that might mirror what you might see, and I'll take you how through how we, we might answer those uh, together. Um, so what happens when blood pressure can't be maintained? This is loss of homeostasis. Obviously, we, we, we've talked a little bit about homeostasis before, but it's something that, that keeps coming up in each section. Um, when you can't maintain blood pressure, you get what's called hypertension. Uh, particularly, this means elevated blood pressure. Uh, clinically, we talk about hypertension being 140 over 90. So if you remember what normal blood pressure is, that's 120 over 80 millimeters mercury. Millimeters mercury is just a, a, uh, a way of measuring pressure. Um, so that's what we call uh, hypertension. Uh, if it's kind of an in-between value, say 130 over 80, we call this pre-hypertension. Okay? Uh, hypertension can be transient, so it's something that can happen when you're sick or when, when, when you're active during exercise, for example. Um, and, and hypertension is also something that's promoted um, uh, by obesity, as an example. Uh, one of the reasons hypertension is bad is because uh, the heart has to work a lot harder, okay? And so the myocardium, the muscle of the heart, that can enlarge in, uh, it can uh, uh, weaken, and, and over, over time, it's just not going to work as well, okay? So the problems kind of compound each other. Um, it can also accelerate something called arthrosclerosis. 
the idea here is that you have this this high blood pressure, and this can damage the sides of um, of blood vessels. And you can get things sticking to the side of those blood vessels, and that's what's represented here. You get build up of, of things like fats, um, and and this will eventually form what's what's called an arthrosclerotic plaque. And the idea here is that this is going to restrict blood flow uh, through that area. Um, and obviously this, this can be, be a problem. If, if that block becomes too great or too consistent, then that can lead to a heart attack. So we talked in lecture 13 and 14 uh, about the idea of a coronary heart attack. And so, so that's the type of thing that can cause a coronary heart attack if this is occurring in those coronary arteries that feed the myocardium of the heart. Okay. Um, one of the other problems here is that as, as this area narrows, what happens to the pressure in this area? So the, the diameter is going to narrow artificially because you're accumulating uh, lipids and whatnot where they shouldn't be. The pressure is only going to increase. So the pressure is going to get worse. As the pressure gets worse, it causes further breakdown of the sides of the vessel, and it's just this vicious cycle. Okay. Uh, hypotension. Hypotension is basically the opposite of hypertension, lower blood pressure. Uh, it's so you could think of 90 over 160 or 90 over 60, not 160. Uh, millimeters mercury. Again, millimeters mercury is just a measurement for blood pressure. Usually this is not going to be too much of a concern unless it's it's causing inadequate flow of, of things like oxygen to, to your muscles or other tissues that need it. Often it can actually be a, be a sign of fitness. Um, uh, the exception, of course, is if you have an injury and you're losing a substantial amount of blood, your, your, your blood pressure will decrease and, and obviously that's a bad sign. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about this concept of tissue perfusion. Um, tissue perfusion is all about how blood gets to where it needs to go. Okay, um, so we're talking about delivery of oxygen to the to the muscles, for example, removal of waste, not just to the muscles, but to, to other tissues as well. Um, gas exchange, we know that this is occurring at the lungs, and we're going to spend four lectures on the lungs actually in, in just a bit. Um, absorption of nutrients, this is occurring in the digestive tract and your information. And we're not going to talk about the details of each of these things. In fact, you'll cover the details of these in, in some cases in other courses. The ones that we will talk about in detail is, is this idea of gas exchange in the lungs, and, and that'll come up in a few lectures. The take-home of this, this section here is that the rate of flow to tissues is, is controlled to, to control the flow of blood to match what the tissue needs. So if your muscles need a lot of oxygen because you're active, well, they're going to get a lot of oxygen, okay? So that's the take-home message of, of, of this idea of autoregulation in the concept of tissue perfusion that we're going to talk about. Okay, uh, two ways of thinking about this. Uh, first of all, there's the intrinsic control. Intrinsic control means the whole body. What's happening on a whole body level? How is your body, body responding to uh, changes in blood pressure um, by regulating cardiac output, for example? That's going to affect has the capacity at least to affect everything in the entire body. But there's also local control. And so local control reflects how can your individual tissues be, be modified so that they get a little bit more or a little bit less regardless of what's happening at the whole body. Okay, So intrinsic control can basically um, override what's happening on a whole body level to provide, say, your muscles with more nutrients, with more oxygen when they're being active. And so you can see that when, uh, when you go from rest to being active, which is represented by this guy playing basketball, that things start to change dramatically. And so, uh, you know, most notably, of course, is that, well, your heart's going to get a little bit more because it's got to act a little bit, uh, a little bit harder, uh, but also the muscles. The muscles are, are, are taking in way more oxygen. And a lot of that is because of increased local uh, control. Okay, and refer to this as intrinsic control. Uh, two types of mechanisms that can govern uh, intrinsic control, autoregulation. Again, this is all about what's happening at the individual tissue levels. First, we'll talk about metabolic controls, and then we'll talk about myogenic controls. Uh, myogenic simply means muscle control. Okay, metabolic controls. Um, so uh, a lot of this is related to the fact that uh, the things that control flow into the individual tissues, so the, the relaxation or constriction of the arterioles or precapillary sphincters, we talked about these previously, um, these are actually under control 
of various nutrients that you might find in those areas. And so let's take uh, one example. And so if you have a declining level of oxygen, what this does to those arterioles and sphincters is it causes them to relax. As they relax, more blood will flow into the capillary beds in that region. That blood will bring with it more oxygen, okay? And so this is a, an example how uh, increased activity will be met with increased uh, oxygen flow to those active tissues. Again, those tissues get what they need. And this is going to be balanced on the other end by, by various chemicals that might do the opposite. And so one example is this chemical called an endothelium. Uh, this is released from endothelial cells, and these actually act as, as potent vasoconstrictors. And so there's this push and pull, but ultimately when you're active, this intrinsic control, this demand for oxygen, this can be, be um, allow for tissues to get what they need at the levels of your muscles. Okay, uh, what about uh, myogenic controls? Uh, again, uh, this is all about getting tissues what they need. And so... Um, uh, one example is when you have increased mean arterial pressure on a vessel, vessel wall, what happens is that the smooth muscle in that same area is going to constrict, and this is going to cause decreased blood flow to the tissue. And so this is important when you have very high blood pressure, for example. You don't want to damage very sensitive tissues. Um, and so what you do is you kind of close off access to those tissues. Those precapillary sphincters are going to are going to clamp down. You're going to have constriction of blood vessels, and so you can't get that uh, very uh, high pressure blood going into those very delicate tissues. And this is what we refer to as kind of these myogenic controls. Okay, increased stretch is regulating the smooth muscle, which is around uh, the tissues in that area. And then that's what happens when you have increased stretch. When you have reduced stretch, it's just the opposite that's going to happen. Okay, So these myogenic controls, these are going to work with those metabolic controls to regulate uh, access to your capillary beds in individual tissues. This uh, could be any tissue, but uh, sometimes it's easiest for students to think of it in terms of, of that tissue being a muscle because we can, we can very easily understand how a, a muscle might need more oxygen, for example. Um, okay, uh, I just want to go over real quickly what I mean by mean arterial pressure. Um, and so if you remember um, previously, uh, your body has actually uh, two types of blood pressure going on at the same time. You have the systolic pressure and you have the diastolic pressure. So systolic pressure is when your heart is contracting and the diastolic pressure is when your heart is relaxing. And this is always going to be a greatest um, right near the heart, the mean arterial pressure. Oh, sorry, the mean arterial pressure is, is uh, not quite an average of those, but uh, it is actually equal um, to the diastolic pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. If you recall, the pulse pressure is the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. So you can go back and look at that equation. So the mean arterial pressure is going to be highest around where the heart is. It's going to decrease when we get into these arteries and arter specifically the arterioles because this is where we get the biggest change in diameter. And then in the capillaries, um, you can see that it's actually still, you know, it's not as high as it was, but it's, 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 there's also a decent amount of pressure still. And again, this is why those myogenic controls are actually so important. It's because if this pressure is too high, when you have that, um, uh, that blood coming into the capillaries, we don't want those capillaries to be damaged. And so if you have high blood pressure, the capillaries are going to seal off and won't let so much blood in. Okay, uh, The blood pressure is then going to mean arterial pressure is then going to decrease as you go into venous system where it's very low. We talked at length about how those various adaptations uh, that these venous uh, systems have in order to get blood back to the heart. And so if you think about them, so there's the, the valves, there's movement by the skeletal muscle. Um, and we also talked, for example, about um, breathing will actually move uh, blood through the venous system as well. And we'll come back and talk about that when we talk about lung function as well. Um, okay, uh, so... Uh, this I've already gone over. Again, uh, mean arterial pressure is high. We don't want that uh, to, be, to be damaging delicate uh, capillary beds. And so when mean arterial pressure is very high, uh, 
where you'll see the smooth muscle um, that controls access to those capillary beds uh, constricting and the sphincters are going to constrict. You're going to cut off those capillary beds and, and prevent them from being damaged by that high pressure. Reduce stretch, we're going to see the opposite. Again, this is all about local control, myogenic muscle controls collaborating with um, the metabolic controls. Metabolic means metabolites, just talking about things like oxygen, but other things such as those endothelial molecules that I pointed out as being released from endothelial cells. Okay, so again, this is another great example of, of um, a diagram which kind of pulls everything together, looking at intrinsic controls, metabolic controls, neuronal controls, hormonal controls. And so if you can understand this diagram, then you'll have a very fantastic uh, sense of what's going on in the big picture. Okay, And these are the types of connections we want you guys to start, at least, to be making throughout this course. Um, and so, so again, um, as we move closer to the final exam, what I'll do is I'll come up with some, some practice questions where we test how some of these things are, are linked together. And hopefully that will help you guys learn how, how to approach studying for this information. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, final note here is that intrinsic and extrinsic uh, things can compete with each other. Um, I mentioned this actually previously, I think, as well. So the idea is that uh, when your heart's pumping very fast, uh, if you want to control flow into a particular tissue, you can, you can, you can prevent uh, really high blood pressure from damaging individual uh, tissues, individual capillary beds. Um, and so those things are always going to compete with each other. Okay, and, and we talked about during an active situation, for example, the types of tissues that are getting the most blood are going to change dramatically. And that's really all I want you to remember with this slide here. Okay, uh, finally, to close out here, we're going to talk about this idea of capillary exchange. Uh, capillary exchange is, is all about getting fluid in and out of capillaries. Um, why do we want to get fluid in and out of capillaries? We want to do that because that's what, what moves... Uh, oxygen, that's what moves carbon dioxide, waste materials, okay? And so generally what we have is when you have a capillary bed, uh, you're going to have oxygen that's being dumped off, and then at the other end of the capillary bed, we're having carbon dioxide that's brought back in. And so the tissues, which are here, so imagine a muscle here, a leg muscle or an arm muscle, um, they're getting oxygen that's dropped off, and then uh, they're, they're, uh, carbon dioxide is being pushed in along with other types of waste as well, uh, which we won't go into too much detail about. Um, and, and this next section here is all about what types of forces push fluid in and out uh, of these uh, capillary beds. Again, we're going out in this direction and in, in this direction. Um, first of all, uh, the, the blood flow through these areas is actually very, very slow compared to the rest of the body. And this is because capillaries branch out considerably. So if you think of a, of a, of a stream that branches into a whole bunch of different uh, uh, smaller streams or tributaries, I guess tributaries is the wrong word to use for a stream, but you get the point. Um, I think it's easy to imagine that those will flow a little bit, a little bit slower. Okay, And so the velocity of, of blood in those capillaries is actually quite low. Uh, compared to what it is in the aorta. When it comes out of the aorta, it's moving pretty fast, okay? Um, it's moving 50 centimeters per second. That is very fast. When you move down to the, the capillaries, it's kind of just nudging along. And then it picks up a little bit of speed as you move through the venous system, okay? So uh, this is, is because the flow rate is, is really kind of inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area here is very high because you get a lot of branching, okay? You have one tributary, being uh, pushed into a whole bunch of different, smaller, but numerous tributaries. Um, and therefore, there's a huge cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area on the other end is, is, is similar to what it is over here. Um, and the velocity of blood is going to be inversely proportional. So that means it's going in the other direction. So you have a, fl a slow flow through the capillaries. And this is actually important for the exchange of, of those fluids and ultimately for oxygen delivery, uh, carbon dioxide pickup and these types of things. Uh, and so, so we want to talk about this idea of capillary exchange. Um, and this is where this idea comes back that we talked about earlier where capillaries are not just these solid structures. Uh, 
Um, in fact, they're far from. And so they have a number of adaptations that allow uh, gases, liquids, um, and even larger things like proteins to be transported from the blood into tissues, okay? And um, the idea here is that uh, we talked about these things called tight junctions. These are these endothelial cells that are, 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 are kind of held together. Sometimes those tight junctions are very tight. Sometimes there's a lot of them. Others, they're, other times they're a little bit more loose. When they're more loose, you can get more fluid moving through them. We also talked about how some um, capillaries uh, have, have pores in their endothelial cells, and we call these fenestrations. And hopefully you remember that fenestrations is, is, uh, comes from the Latin word fenetra. Fenetra is um, uh, um, uh, is is a window, okay? So window uh, allows movement of, of solutes and gases and things like this, okay? Um, so there's different ways that, uh, that things can move through a capillary into tissues. Um, and so it can move uh, directly through membranes, okay? And so this is often seen with lipid soluble things like uh, respiratory gases. So this is one example and that's pushed out by the, by the pressure. Um, so that's what we see here. There's uh, examples of things that can move through these clefts or through the fenestrations. And this is, example here is kind of water soluble uh, solutes. And so salts is an example. Uh, uh, sodium chloride is just an example. Potassium is an example. Um, you can also get active transport. Um, and so this is, is active transport things that actually move things using energy across the membrane one side to the other. And this might be used for active things or for larger molecules such as proteins. Okay. So where are these things moving? I kept saying they're moving into tissues. Are they moving into the cells of the tissues? Not really. First, they move into uh, the, what's called the interstitial space. Interstitial space is just the space between two different cells. Okay. Um, and so the idea being that um, if you have the cell of a muscle and you have the, um, if you have the, the cell of uh, a capillary, you're not just getting a particle moving directly from one to the other. It has to go into the in-between space first, okay? So it goes out of one cell type, then it's in the in-between space, and then it's taken up by the other cell type. So that's what we mean by interstitial fluid. Okay, um, so the flow through capillaries, again, it's related to um, uh, pressure. Uh, when we talk about uh, pressure, it's related in part to, to this idea of cross-sectional area and velocity of blood flow. Um, so know that pressure very close to the heart is, is very high. Pressure down by the capillaries is much lower. Um, and so by the time we get down to the capillaries, there's actually two opposing forces that are going to determine whether fluid is moving in or moving out of those capillaries. And again, where is it moving to? Is it moving directly into those tissue cells? No, it moves first into the interstitial space. Okay. So uh, two forces that are going to dictate fluid flow um, from the capillaries. Again, when I say fluid flow, what I mean is there's fluid that flows out in this end of the capillary, and it's going to flow back in to this area of the capillary. Uh, there's uh, two different types of pressures. One is hydrostatic pressure. What is hydrostatic pressure? That's just the pressure that's in the blood vessel, okay? So uh, just as we talk about mean arterial pressure, Hydrostatic pressure is that same type of pressure that's uh, forcing, uh, that, that's pushing on the vessel wall, okay? The interior fluid pushing on the vessel wall. That's opposed by, by a force that's a little bit more difficult to understand, and that's the called colloidal pressure. And that's basically a, a, a force that's sucking back in, um, into the capillary. So the idea is that when you have dissolved substances in the blood, that's going to want to hold the water in the vessel, okay? So if you have a lot of salt in, in your blood, that's going to want to hold uh, the, the blood in the capillary, um, whereas you have this hydrostatic pressure, which is pushing outward. So those are the two opposing forces. Um, and you can have hydrostatic pressure and colloidal pressure both within the capillary, and you can have them within the extracellular fluid, okay? So just as there's a hydrostatic pressure in this direction, there's also a hydrostatic pressure in the other direction, the interstitial fluid um, pushing back inwards. 
as we'll see, most of the forces from the interstitial fluid are negligible when we start to talk about hydrostatic and colloidal pressures that are working from the capillary. Okay, so um, we can think of this idea called net filtration uh, or net filtration uh, pressure. And this is basically looking at all of the forces acting on the capillary bed. And so what this says is that um, the net filtration pressure is equal to the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary plus the, uh, the uh, uh, colloidal pressure um, in the interstitial space uh, or the osmotic pressure in the interstitial space. That's what this means, IF, okay, interstitial fluid minus the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial space um, plus the osmotic pressure in the capillary, okay? Um, now, if you find this complicated, then just hold with me for another slide or so, and you'll see how a diagram of how all this works. What this is telling us is about the net fluid flow at the arterial end, which we call filtration, versus the net fluid flow at the venous end, which is reabsorption. So this would be the arterial end. This is filtration. Stuff's going out. When it's coming back in on the venous end, it's called uh, it's called reabsorption. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the equation that that uh, dictates whether things are going in or out. Now let's look at what those terms actually mean. Okay. So let's first look at what's happening at the arterial end. Okay. At the arterial end, uh, this in. What this means, what this refers to is the blood is flowing in at the arterial end. So when blood flows in to the capillary bed, what's happening? Now, if you recall previously, the blood pressure, which again, I equated to hydrostatic pressure, is equal to 35 millimeters mercury. So that's this pressure pushing outward on the capillary bed, okay? And it's pushing outward into the capillary bed. Um, now, there's another pressure, the osmotic pressure, that is pulling inwards. So this means that when there's salts or things that are, that are in here, they're pulling backwards um, and, and trying to resist this hydro hydrostatic pressure. It's harder for this hydrostatic pressure to push outwards into this interstitial space if there's this colloidal pressure or osmotic pressure, which is trying to pull back in. So you have these two dueling forces. 35 millimeters mercury, and this one is 26 millimeters mercury. So who wins, 35 or 26? 35 is bigger, 35 is gonna win. And so you're gonna have fluid which pushes out. And so that's why at the capillary, or at the arterial end, when again, blood is going in on this side, you see um, that fluid is gonna be pushed out into the hydrostatic space. Now, again, there's hydrostatic pressure and colloidal pressure happening from the intercellular, the interstitial fluid as well. So that's the pressure this way in the pull or suction of salts here. But these are usually taken up very quickly by other cells. Again, this could be a cell of a muscle, like this little arch I'm drawing here with my cursor. That could represent another cell where salts and fluids are, are taken up. So these are usually pretty much negligible in terms of, of the, their overall effect. Really, we're talking about these two things here, okay? Um, and so in this end, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have uh, the, the fluid which is pushed out into the interstitial space. But look what happens when we get to the venous end. Well, the colloidal pressure is actually the same, okay? So the amount of salts and stuff over that short distance is, is, is actually the same. So it's still 26 millimeters mercury. That's the pulling inwards. And so uh, the only thing that really changes is the hydrostatic pressure. And that's because you've traveled another short distance, okay, across a big cross-sectional area. What happens is the blood pressure, again, we're referring to it as hydrostatic pressure within the capillaries, uh, decreases, okay? So it decreases from uh, 35 to 17. And now it's the colloidal pressure, it's the sucking pressure um, that wins out. And so what you're going to do is you're going to have um, a fluid which moves back into the, the capillary, okay? So you're having fluid move out at the, uh, at the arterial end, and you're having uh, 
uh, fluid move back in at the venous end. Now again, I've indicated in and out up here. This refers to the blood going in or out of the capillary bed, okay? Blood goes in at the arterial end, out at the venous end, and with that, you have fluid flowing in the opposite direction. So fluid goes out on the arterial end and in, in the, uh, on, on the venous end, okay? And that's what drives delivery of nutrients and then picking up of, of waste. It's not enough to deliver your nutrients. You need to, to, to pick up the wastes from those tissues as well. Again, the example we'll talk about again and again is oxygen and carbon dioxide, okay? Um, okay, so that's the, the, the main material that, uh, that, that is the material that I, I wanted to cover in terms of blood vessels. The next bunch of slides, what you'll see is big lists of these major arteries and, and veins, okay? And um, in some sections, uh, in some years, they, they have students kind of memorize all these things. Uh, even during uh, a regular school year where we're not doing this by distance, and so exams can, can very easily have, have labeling questions on them, I, I really don't like uh, students to waste their time memorizing all this stuff. Um, and so, so what I always say is, um, people will not be tested on, on any of these unless we've talked about it elsewhere as part of another slide. And so one example might be, uh, you know, the, the coronary arteries and veins, the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, aorta, uh, pulmonary veins and arteries, those types of things. There will be others that come up as we talk about the lungs. Um, but you're not going to need to know, you know, facial vein, occipital vein, posterior whatever that is vein. Um, you know, we did talk a little bit about the carotid arteries. Um, and so you might need to know what that is. Now, this is a little bit of a, a special year because of COVID, the distance learning. Uh, you, that's another reason you wouldn't have kind of these labeling type questions. And so, so the, the answer is, do you need to know all of these veins and arteries that I'm, I'm scrolling through here? The answer is uh, no unless I have, have talked about it in depth on a, a different slide, like uh, in an earlier or, or later part of the presentation, okay? So, so don't waste your time memorizing all these things. It's not a trick. You're not gonna need to know uh, all these things unless I go, go into them in detail. And you're not gonna have labeling questions, because again, if I just uh, put this uh, diagram on, on a final exam and uh, ask you to label it. Well, you can just flip to this diagram and, and fill it in easy. So that's not really testing anything. My argument is that it's not really testing anything meaningful even in on a regular year because I don't really believe in uh, simply memorizing things just, just for names unless, unless there's some sort of a purpose behind it. That said, in, in future years, you may have to learn more about these things. For now, what I want you to do is, is, is look through here um, you know, again, do you need to know all these? No, not unless we've talked about it in detail um, in, um, in, a, in another lecture. Again, an example might be um, superior vena cava. Well, we talked about that pretty extensively for the heart, so you should know about that. You should know where it is. Um, and so, so, yeah, and so what I want you to do is really kind of uh, scroll through these, take a look at it, and really appreciate that, that you know, there's a lot going on. The circulatory system is obviously very complicated, um, and so that's why a lot of the regulation that we talked about, extrinsic, whole body, intrinsic, various tissues, why that's actually so important, okay? So, so that's all I want uh, in, in this scenario, and, and I can imagine I might get some questions about what I mean by all that, and, and I'm happy to answer those as well. Okay, so summary here, we finished off looking at short-term regulation. Um, we, we looked at long-term regulation. Long-term regulation is all about blood volume, okay? Um, the idea here is that things like baroreceptors, these are gonna conk out over a while. And so, so we need another mechanism to deal with blood pressure. Um, and this is long-term regulation through regulation of blood volume. Um, we talked a little bit about high and low blood pressure, basically just definitions. Um, and then we were all we were talking about blood filtration, okay? Um, and we're going to use this as kind of a prelude to to the lymphatic system. Um, and so the lymphatic system is is a system that returns fluid from the interstitial space that doesn't make its way back into the venous system. And so the idea here is that uh, 
you push out 20 liters of blood um, and you'll get back 17 into your capillaries. That extra three liters is dealt with something by something called the lymphatic system. Um, and we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. It's a, it's a cool lecture because a lot of people never even really knew that this system existed in their bodies. And so, so I think that that's pretty neat. Um, you guys have an exam coming up, depending on when you look at this uh, um, exam, if you don't, or this lecture, if you don't, you may not look at it before the, uh, before the midterm on November 19th. Uh, but if you do, uh, then uh, good luck on the exam. If you don't, then well, good luck on the, uh, on the final exam. Um, and as always, uh, if, uh, if you have uh, any questions, then, then please just, uh, just let me know. Uh, okay, thank you.